so with that, I am going to turn it over to Debbie to get us started. Thanks, Sam. And hello to everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight for the presentation from Chris Cameron. I'm especially pleased for the topic that he'll be covering here. It's a, something near and dear to my heart and something that I've been working on in my involvement in the secular movement too, is trying to help promote history involving black free thinkers. So very glad you can make it, Chris. I'll give a quick introduction and then turn it over to you and we can discuss some things afterwards. So Chris okay. is a history professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte with research and teaching interests in African-American and early American history, including slavery, the anti-slavery movement, religious and intellectual history. His first book was To Plead Our Own Cause, African-Americans, Massachusetts, and the Making of the Anti-Slavery Movement, where he explored the relationship between Puritan theology and the rise of Black abolitionism, and argues throughout the work that African-Americans were central to the development of the anti-slavery movement in America. His latest book is Black Free Thinkers, A History of African-American Secularism. It just came out last year in October, and it's what he'll be talking about tonight. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Chris. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to give this talk, and thanks to you and Sam for uh, organizing it and uh, for promoting it pretty heavily on uh, social media. It's great to see such um, such a robust crowd of uh, over 200 uh, people here, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking a bit about the book and then engaging uh, in the Q&A with both Debbie and you guys uh, after the talk. Um, so I'm basically just going to give an overview uh, of the argument uh, and the uh, four chapters um, of the book. Um, now, I can't give the entire tradition of uh, Black Free Thought justice in um, just a short 30-minute uh, or so talk, but I would like to sort of briefly outline its historical trajectory, um, ideological suppositions, and major goals for advancing causes of social justice and racial equality. So I'll begin with some information on the origins of black free thought during the 19th century before discussing the many ways that uh, secularism intersected with the long civil rights movement and the black freedom struggle of the 20th century. So African-American free thought arose in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, unlike the Enlightenment origins of free thought among white intellectuals such as Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, black free thought grew out of the institution of slavery and the condition that blacks endured within it. The increased evangelism to slaves that characterized what's known as the Second Great Awakening of the early 19th century also brought to the fore what um, many saw to be the hypocritical nature of their Christian masters, including the very practice of holding slaves itself, but also the way that their masters treated them. So one of the key reasons that African Americans in the 19th century embraced free thought was an inability to resolve the problem of evil, or the question of how to reconcile the existence of evil in the world with the presence of a benevolent and omnipotent deity. For many enslaved people, the problem of evil was intimately related to their daily lives as a central component of slavery was suffering. Many uh, slaves did find meaning in religion, whether monotheistic ones such as Christianity uh, or Islam, or African-derived traditions such as conjure um, and hoodoo, but others rejected religion altogether. The historian Al Rabito, a scholar of African-American religion, notes that um, the meaning many slaves found in religion was not so much an answer to the problem of suffering as the acceptance of the sorrow and joy inherent in human condition and an affirmation that life in itself was valuable. But for many slaves, they did not feel that a life under slavery was valuable under any conditions, and they needed um, an answer to this problem of suffering before they could accept the idea of a god or gods. When this answer didn't come, they embraced atheism as the only logical solution to the problem of evil. 
Now, for uh, decades, historians like Rabbiteau and others have used slave narratives to document multiple aspects of the black religious experience. But these narratives also speak to the presence of atheism within 19th century slave communities. Austin Stewart, uh, for example, wrote a slave narrative in the 1850s um, where he's discussing a brutal whipping um, that his master delivered to his sister uh, on a Sabbath morning. And he's very careful to point out a number of times that this occurred uh, on the Sabbath. And he asks in his narrative, can anyone wonder that I and other slaves often doubted the sincerity of every white man's religion? Can it be a matter of astonishment that slaves often feel there is no just God for the poor African? So this speaks directly to this question of the problem of evil, right? He sees uh, his sister enduring this brutal whipping, ironically, on a Sunday morning. And he actually says this is this happened while he was going to church, right? That immediately after uh, his master whipped his sister, they proceeded on to the local Presbyterian church, right? So um, intellectually for him, this is something that led uh, many uh, slaves in the antebellum South um, towards atheism. Charles Ball is another enslaved man that um, reflects on the irreligiosity present within slave communities in his uh, slave narrative. He writes, there is in general very little sense of religious obligation or duty amongst the slaves on the cotton plantations. Um, and Christianity, he says, cannot be with propriety called the religion of these people. They have not the slightest religious regard for the Sabbath day and their masters make no efforts to impress them with the least respect for this sacred institution. So in this passage, Ball addresses one of the key components of free thought among slaves, namely a disregard for the Sabbath that was fostered in part by masters' opposition to converting their slaves. Um, and another enslaved uh, man named Henry Bibbs uh, sort of backs up this point from Charles Ball. Um, in his narrative, Bibb writes that, uh, quote, the Sabbath is not regarded by a large number of slaves as a day of rest. They have no schools to go to, no moral or religious instruction at all in many localities where there are hundreds of slaves. Hence, they resort to some kind of amusement. Those who make no profession of religion, he writes, resort to the woods in large numbers on that day to gamble, fight, get drunk, and break the Sabbath. So here we see from Bibbs some pretty direct evidence that there are indeed uh, slaves in the antebellum South who, quote, make no profession of religion, right? And instead of reading the Bible, instead of attending church uh, with their masters on Sunday, he says, actually, their masters don't really care um, to have uh, to give them religious instruction, right? And this is something else that causes um, irreligiosity and atheism in the slave community. Um, sort of this just general disregard on the part of masters uh, for their slaves' conversion. Now, another key development that fostered the growth of African American atheism was the rise of pro slavery religion. And this started to um, especially take off uh, after the 19, after the 1830s, right? Um, the 1820s and the 1830s is when we see a sort of mo uh, more robust uh, abolitionist movement start to develop. And um, in response to that, we start to see sort of a strengthening um, of the pro-slavery movement, of pro-slavery kind of political philosophy, stuff like uh, James Henry Hammond's uh, mud sill speech that he gave. Uh, this is a senator in South Carolina. And we also see the sort of strengthening of pro-slavery religion and pro-slavery theology. Henry Bibb writes of white preachers in his uh, slave narrative that the slaves with but few exception have no confidence at all in their preaching because they preach a pro-slavery doctrine. And they say, servants, be obedient to your masters, and he that knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. So most slaves um, felt that they were destined to die in bondage unless they were delivered by some deity. And Bibb notes that when um, that doesn't happen, when they're not delivered from bondage, when their lives actually are seemingly getting worse, he writes, they cannot believe or trust in such a religion as above named. So 
we see this inability to resolve the problem of evil. We see uh, masters either um, sort of disregarding their slaves' religious instruction or even actively um, opposing religion uh, among their slaves. And then we see the rise of pro-slavery theology after the 1830s being uh, some of the key reasons um, and key sort of foundations um, for African-American free thought in the 19th century. Now, aside from the free thinker Frederick Douglass, what we see during the era of slavery among many blacks is not necessarily um, secular humanism as we would know it today, but rather atheism and agnosticism. They were skeptical about the existence of God, but their condition as enslaved people sort of precluded um, that the type of activism, the type of kind of political commitment um, that we associate with humanism. For those enslaved people who did end up gaining their freedom, um, however, those uh, free thinkers and slaves who did gain their freedom like Frederick Douglass or William Wells Brown, we do see them being sort of very active, uh, not only in the anti-slavery movement, but in the case of Frederick Douglass, um, also in the women's rights movement. Um, so where uh, free thought among African Americans would really start to take off, uh, would be in the 20th century with the Harlem Renaissance. We see the sort of roots of African-American free thought during the antebellum period, um, but actually there was something of a, of a reversion to religiosity um, and increasing kind of Christianization of the black population after the Civil War. Um, and this is largely because of, you know, notions of exodus and um, that, that sort of God had delivered African Americans out of bondage. Um, now uh, slaves actually have access to religious instruction. They can build their own churches or sort of, sorry, former slaves um, have access to their own churches now. So you start to see the rise of like the AME Church, the AME Zion Church, uh, proliferation of black Baptist churches. Um, but things would sort of start to swing the other way again in the late 19th and the early 20th century in response to the sort of rise of Jim Crow uh, in the United States, as well as other developments like uh, the New Negro or the Harlem Renaissance um, beginning in the late 19 teens and the early 1920s. Um, so the second chapter of my book explores um, the sort of um, growth of free thought during the Harlem Renaissance. This is sort of a literary and intellectual movement um, that flowered among African Americans uh, in urban areas like Chicago, um, New Orleans, Detroit, and especially New York City, um, and really took off after 1919, 1920 or so. Um, one of the sort of uh, factors leading to the Harlem Renaissance was what's known as the Great Migration from the South. This is where we see approximately one and a half million black Southerners um, moving from the rural South to the urban North, right? So all of a sudden you have an explosion um, of the black populations in some of these urban centers like Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, and New York City. Um, we also see after the end of World War I, a kind of intense backlash uh, from whites towards African Americans. Um, many African Americans actually served in World War I out of a sense of patriotic duty, but also out of a hope that um, military service would be sort of a powerful argument for racial equality, right? They felt that you, they couldn't be denied uh, their rights in the United States if they showed that they were willing to die for their country and to fight for democracy. Well, um, those people who thought that could not have been more wrong. In fact, um, African-American soldiers coming back wearing their military uniforms were often um, the targets of racial violence, right? It, it just really made a lot of uh, white supremacists and racists incredibly angry seeing, um, so seeing African-Americans in their military uniforms. And you see blacks being attacked uh, when they're coming back at train stations and all throughout the South and even the Midwest as well. Um, so this is known, uh, this sort of rise of racial violence um, was known as the Red Summer of 1919. You see sort of mob activity um, and, and increase in lynchings in 1919 and would continue on into the 1920s. So this um, 
sort of increasing backlash uh, from whites led a number of African-American intellectuals and artists to uh, sort of emphasize cultural approaches to solving racism. Right. It, they felt that um, sort of overt political activity was um, maybe a little bit too dangerous. Right. So they instead of uh, marching or organizing or something like that, they started um, to make their argument for racial equality um, through uh, through their work, through their artwork, through their literature, through uh, theater. Um, and we see the Harlem Renaissance being a really critical moment in the history of black free thought um, because for the first time, a number of African Americans who may have been the sort of sole uh, free thinker in their small uh, rural town in the South, all of a sudden they're together in community with other kind of like-minded, um, educated uh, African Americans who maybe share their religious skepticism. So Zora Neale Hurston is kind of a case in point. Um, she grew up in Eatonville, Florida, an all-black town. Her father was a preacher um, in Eatonville, and she writes in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, um, published in the early 1940s, that she never felt she could be open about her skepticism that she began questioning religion um, at a very young age, probably when she was eight or nine years old, right? But she never quite felt that she could actually share those questions with other people, right? She felt that she would be uh, shunned uh, by her community. Langston Hughes, growing up in uh, Joplin, Missouri, also was very skeptical um, about the existence and power of Jesus. Um, probably from the age of 12 or 13 years old, right? And he writes about this uh, in his autobiography, The Big C. Uh, but once again, he wasn't necessarily around people that he could be open with um, about his skepticism. Once these people, you know, get together in Harlem, though, um, now they're around like-minded people. They're around people with sort of similar educational backgrounds. Hughes attended uh, Columbia for a little while. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston got her bachelor's and her master's degree from uh, Barnard College, uh, part of Columbia University. Uh, Nella Larson was another really prominent one, uh, highly educated herself, uh, went to Fisk and uh, worked at Tuskegee University. Um, so being around like-minded, sort of educated, uh, critical African-Americans sort of helped to build community, right? Um, it helped these free thinkers be able to sort of refine um, some of their ideas, and it helped give them the kind of confidence to be a little more uh, open about some of these ideas. Not completely open, but at least willing to kind of write about them and articulate their ideas, right? So Nella Larson, for example, um, she wasn't necessarily going around lecturing on free thought, but she did uh, in the late 1920s uh, write her novel Quicksand, um, and the central character in that, Helga Crane, is widely thought to sort of represent her and has a lot of the kind of same um, experiences, uh, travels to the same places, um, has a lot of the same experiences that uh, Larson herself did, right? Um, so you see this sort of increasing boldness and willingness to kind of share their ideas, um, to use their poetry, um, in the case of Hughes, to use their anthropological works, in the case of Hurston, uh, and to use their literature um, and novels, in the case of Larson, to articulate um, their free thought. And what we see is that some of the kind of most prominent writers uh, in African American culture, people that you know I, I had read in middle school and high school, but never really knew they were free thinkers, they're articulating their skepticism in their autobiographies, in their poetry, uh, and in their novels. Now, um, the, the third chapter of my book looks at really the same period uh, as the Harlem Renaissance, um, but it takes a very different approach. So while some African Americans sort of um, eschewed kind of overt political activity and used kind of cultural approaches to making the argument for racial equality, um, others sort of ramped things up and actually um, rejected the sort of mainstream political parties and ideologies 
uh, of their day uh, and embraced both socialism and communism in the 19-teens, 1920s, and 1930s. Um, now, ideologically, both the socialists and communists seem to be much more kind of open and receptive to having African Americans as kind of part of their burgeoning political and intellectual movements, right? We know that, you know, a number of early socialists, um, a number of leading socialists were sort of highly racist, right? Um, and, you know, but that sort of intellectually, they still kind of seemed and appeared um, open to having African Americans as part of their movement, right? Hubert Harrison, for example, uh, was hired as sort of a, kind of uh, a, a sort of a socialist speaker and somebody who could help kind of bring um, socialism to uh, the African-American community of New York um, in the early 19-teens. Uh, the communists were also very appealing to African-Americans um, largely because of their uh, sort of anti-colonialism, right? Um, their sort of internationalist perspective that seemed to accord well with a burgeoning sense of pan-Africanism, right, in the early 20th century, this idea that all African peoples are connected, their destiny is connected, um, and they should sort of unite around the world, right, African Americans, Haitians, Liberians, and whatnot, share similar histories, um, and they could kind of unite politically to oppose uh, colonialism, imperialism, and white supremacy. And on um, the communists, the, their sort of internationalism seemed to um, kind of cohere uh, with that increasing goal of a number of black intellectuals uh, and political thinkers. Um, so we see during the, from the 19 teens through the 1930s, a number of African American free thinkers um, also embrace socialism and communism. We also know that communists were explicitly anti-religious, right? Um, a directive from the Comintern, the Communist International in 1926, um, said very clearly that we expect communists around the world um, to be non-religious or to be atheists, right? And if you went to a local communist meeting in Chicago or New York City or whatnot, it was expected um, that you were going to be an atheist or an agnostic and that you were not going to be um, a church member. I've even encountered in the course of my research some African Americans who uh, went to the Black Unitarian Church, Egbert Ethel Red Brown's Harlem Unitarian Church, uh, and even faced a little bit of pushback from their communist groups in, in New York saying, why are you going to this church, even though it's probably sort of the most liberal and, and open church that you could find. So um, this sort of anti-religiosity uh, on the part of communists is something that was also appealing uh, to African-American freethinkers. So we see a number of um, black intellectuals and freethinkers joining these movements. Hubert Harrison uh, is probably one of the most prominent, right? Uh, Harry Haywood would be, uh, the one sort of African-American free thinker who probably attained sort of the highest um, position within the Communist Party. And he was one of the people who helped articulate uh, the party's Black Belt thesis in 1928, which is really key to kind of spreading communism among African-Americans um, sort of uh, in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s. Um, other Black socialists and communists uh, include uh, Louise Thompson Patterson, who was a really important organizer, um, the writer Richard Wright, um, and you see sort of the influence of communism uh, in some of his works like Native Son, right, um, as well as W.E.B. Du Bois, who um, noted that, uh, noted in his autobiography that um, he embraced socialism while he was studying abroad in Germany. Um, during the uh, late 1890s, um, and he would be uh, a socialist for um, 
probably the next three decades or so, and then he started to move more into communism um, later into the 1940s uh, and 1950s, and would even be sort of politically persecuted by um, the House on American Activities Committee um, during the 1950s. One of the things that actually would lead to his uh, repatriation to um, Ghana um, in the early 1960s. Um, now, Du Bois is a really interesting figure because he kind of spans all of the four chapters in my book, right? Du Bois was born in um, 1968. Um, he, he had basically become a free thinker uh, by the end of the 19th century. He was one of the individuals who helped to really forward uh, the Harlem Renaissance by publishing uh, you know, poems of Langston Hughes, publishing uh, short stories from Nella Larson, pieces from Zora Neale Hurston, um, all of these uh, black freethinkers who are writers of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he's also part of this kind of socialist and communist movement among African American freethinkers uh, in the 1920s and 30s. And then he lives until 1963, um, sort of right kind of in the middle of what we now think of as the modern civil rights movement. So he really spans all of these uh, various chapters. Um, and his work kind of shows that, um, you know, that free thought was really prominent among really the most important intellectual of his generation and that his influence would really spread to a lot of other um, intellectuals, artists, and writers uh, during his very long life. Now, looking towards the end of uh, his life and the beginning um, of the civil rights movement, this is a, a political movement that's often portrayed as having its foundation in African-American religion. Um, my book doesn't necessarily deny that, right? I don't deny the influence of uh, religion in, in black political thought and organizing, um, but I do, I do show that there's another kind of side to the story. Right. Um, and this other side of the story is that black free thinkers were central players in the civil rights movement um, of the 1960s. We can see this especially with uh, the black power movement. So black power emerged out of the civil rights activity of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966. Um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as it was known, has, had been created in 1960. It was uh, initially led by Christian activists such as John Lewis, who was committed to the philosophy of nonviolence. Um, but the approach of SNCC soon started to change, especially after James Foreman took over the group. Foreman grew up in rural Mississippi. He had started moving away from religion um, as a young man. Um, and in his own autobiography, The Making of Black Revolutionaries, we see a scene that's actually repeated in, um, in Langston Hughes's work, in uh, Richard Wright's work, uh, in uh, Zora Neale Hurston's as well, namely this sort of um, feigned conversion experience uh, that, it, that becomes the basis uh, of his secularism. Just like Langston Hughes, just like Zora Neale Hurston, James Foreman sees this kind of fake, fake conversion experience as the start of his journey towards atheism. And that journey would be solidified um, after studying philosophy at Wilson Junior College in Chicago. And he would bring a secular perspective to his civil rights activity. He actually states very clearly in his autobiography that he feels that a religion is harming African Americans. It's making them think that um, God is going to bring them their rights. God is going to bring them equality uh, eventually, right? In the by and by, and it's it's causing people not to do the sort of hard work um, of organizing right now. 
Now, I will say that he really mischaracterized a lot of uh, African-American religion. Now, it, it certainly was the case that you know, there were individuals who uh, were looking more towards the afterlife, but there's also a very strong tradition of social and political organizing in Black Christianity that, that he was ignoring. But nevertheless, this was his perspective, right? That religion was kind of harmful um, to the African-American community, and he would bring this secular perspective um, to his organizing and to, uh, both to the Black Power movement. Now, the main institutional expression of Black Power was the Black Panther Party. This was a secular organization created in 1966 with the explicit um, purpose of promoting uh, Black pride, promoting Black um, economic independence and political independence. Some members of uh, the Black Panther Party eventually wanted to have sort of a separate Black nation, right? So they're advocates of Black nationalism. But in the short term, they were really focused on promoting Black economic and political autonomy, right? Through things like um, the free breakfast program that became incredibly widespread is probably what they were most uh, well known for, right? And by electing Black uh, political candidates in places like uh, Newark, New Jersey, right, in Oakland, California. And many prominent leaders, uh, including the founders of the Black Panther Party, um, like Huey Newton, David Hilliard, and Eldridge Cleaver, were very outspoken in their atheism. Like earlier thinkers, they saw the church as conservative, and they advanced a humanist politics that rejected the authority of what they often derisively termed uh, Uncle Tom bootlicking preachers. Now, the Black Panther Party was sort of the political expression of Black power. Its literary and intellectual expression is known as the Black Arts Movement, which lasted roughly a decade from the mid-1960s to the mid-1970s. Writers of the Black Arts Movement had multiple goals, promoting and articulating Black pride, Black nationalism, uh, and rejecting respectability politics, which for many went hand in hand with the rejection of Christianity. Um, and one of the key figures of this movement was James Baldwin. Baldwin rejected religion because he viewed it as otherworldly and unsuited to uh, addressing the problems of black people in America. And you see this rejection of religion in uh, a number of works from Baldwin. Um, Blues for Mr. Charlie, uh, his book Go Tell It on the Mountain, uh, and his autobiographical work The Fire Next Time, published in 1963. Um, and here he notes that he had been a teenage preacher in Harlem during the 1940s. Um, and even after being a preacher for three years, he writes, the blood of the lamb had not cleansed me in any way, whatever. I was just as black as I'd been the day that I was born. And he says, you know, when I stood in front of a congregation and faced them, it took all the strength that I had not to curse, not to tell them to just throw away their Bibles, um, get off their knees and go and organize a rent strike. So this is sort of that same uh, position as James Foreman, namely that African-American religion is uh, otherworldly and it's not something that's going to be very useful in addressing um, the myriad of problems that African-Americans face today. Another really prominent writer um, of the Black Arts Movement who was also a free thinker was Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and secularism heavily influenced her literature. Um, she's most well known for her play, uh, A Raisin in the Sun, which um, features uh, a woman, a young woman named Benita, who Hansberry says is very, uh, says in an interview later on, that basically represents her. Benita is kind of a modern woman who embraces feminism, anti-colonialism, and atheism. Many people urge her to marry her middle-class suitor, um, but she decides to wait until her schooling is complete, basically putting her career um, ahead of middle-class domesticity. When Benita's mom asks her, uh, or remarks that she'll be a doctor if God wills it, Benita replies, God hasn't got a thing to do with it. And she goes on to express her frustration that God gets all the credit for human achievements, asking whether or not God would be paying her tuition. Um, now, uh, Benita, like I said, basically expresses Hansbury's own secular perspective. 
um, in an interview with Mike Wallace shortly after Raisin in the Sun came out, but um, Hansbury says, Benita is me eight years ago. For Hansbury, human beings have the capacity for morality through the use of reason and do not need God in order to be good people. And when human beings achieve something in the world, we should recognize them rather than attribute their accompl accomplishments to an unseen deity. We don't need mysticism to exalt man, she claimed in another interview. Man exalts himself by his achievements. And her perspective on religion was similar to that of Zora Neale Hurston, namely that we attribute to God the aspects of nature and human life that we do not understand. Unlike Hurston, Hansbury didn't see this as a weakness, but rather a strength. It was just a strength, she said, that um, she didn't need. So to wrap up, um, despite views of African Americans as naturally religious, uh, free thought, secularism, atheism, agnosticism has been a vital and significant component of black culture and politics since the 19th century. This history is not um, an obscure one. Uh, sources on black free thinkers are readily available. Most of the slave narratives um, I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk can be found in this uh, very accessible online repository documenting the American South. And of course, a lot of the other people that I've, that I've discussed throughout this talk are very well-known writers um, and intellectuals. And if we just kind of look hard enough and um, and read enough of their works, we can see this kind of secular perspective um, throughout their writings. I think it's really vital to understand and teach this history, um, especially to show black skeptics today um, or people who are maybe on the fence, maybe they're, they're doubting religion, but they don't necessarily feel that there's a place uh, in the secular community for them, to show them that they're part of a long tradition of prominent black free thinkers, uh, one that sort of includes uh, some of the most significant thinkers and political activists um, and intellectuals in African American life. Thank you very much. Awesome. I've heard you give this talk once before. <laughs> Yep. And I still learn so much, and it's why I think I'm going to keep the book on my shelf for some time longer, uh, because I could use a reread and better note-taking next time. Thank you, Chris, for this sure, presentation. So I think I think one of the really valuable things about your work is, is what you just said. Too often, not just within the Black community, but generally in history classes, in our public narratives, we're given an entirely Christian perspective on black civil rights movement, on abolition and slavery, uh, mm -hmm. on like what it is to be black in America anyway, right? Like yeah. we couldn't have been freed from anything unless there was Christianity and churches. And you know, the only reason that the civil rights movement happened is Martin Luther King <laughs> mm -hmm. and churches and religion. And so black atheism, and black free thought and skepticism is seen as a challenge to that, as a threat, as a problem that some, you know, we can't get freed if we're not in the churches, right? Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that your book can challenge that in this researched way. So my first question is, how did you even beget, become interested in a project like this? Um, they're probably, I guess uh, two factors that um, that played a role in me starting to write this book. Um, so the first is I was finishing up my first book on um, African American abolitionists, and and that looked at um, partially or largely at sort of Puritan theology and, and early Black abolitionist thoughts. So I'm one of these the people who contributes to this notion of of religiosity and Black civil rights. Um, but I was I was just doing some final edits for that, and, and I was rereading this uh, really foundational text um, on African American religion by Al Rabito called Slave Religion. Um, and for most of the book, he's he's looking at sort of the 
uh, rise of evangelical Protestantism among uh, the enslaved population, the sort of fusion or syncretism um, of African traditions and black Christianity, um, but basically is looking at blacks who believed in God. And um, towards the very end of the book, he has like a paragraph or, or maybe a page or so, right? That says, you know, not all uh, slaves believed in God. Some couldn't reconcile notions of a benevolent deity with their uh, with their you know status as slaves and I had never read anything like that right I'd never read anything about slaves who are atheists and he gives a, just a couple examples he doesn't really go too deeply uh, into it but it just it really kind of piqued my interest and that's where I started sort of looking for all the examples I could find um, of atheism in the slave community, right? Um, just started doing some Googling, came across Anthony Penn's work um, and his, uh, his book, By These Hands, a documentary history of African-American humanism uh, was really important in pointing me to some sources from Frederick Douglass. And then, you know, th this book is like, it's, uh, it has a lot of excerpts of primary sources. Um, and so being the historian that I am, I went back to sort of the full primary source, right? If you have an excerpt from My Bondage and My Freedom, I went back and I read the whole thing. And I found there's actually a lot more than just this little excerpt here that, that, he, that he has to kind of cut off because of space. And then I just started looking for other slave narratives and found that this is really important tradition in the 19th century. And if that's the case, it's probably even more significant um, moving forward. Right. So there was there was kind of that scholarly component. This was, I think, in late 2012 or something. Um, but there's also kind of the personal component in that uh, I had been at that point an atheist for probably two, two and a half years or something um, was pretty kind of isolated. I didn't I didn't really know a lot of other black atheists. Now, you know, being in academia, I knew plenty of white atheists, right? M most of my white friends are either like Unitarian Universalists or religious skeptics or whatnot, um, or just not very religious at all. Um, but I didn't know any other black atheists, right? So I started kind of trying to find some way to connect uh, with other black free thinkers. And I started finding the blogs and, you know, African Americans for Humanism. Um, you, I, that site had like little profiles of black humanists, right? Um, and I went from those profiles back to their works, right? Back to their writings. Um, and, and again, kind of that sort of reinforced this idea that this is a very vibrant tradition, that we have these bits and pieces, right, in, in certain areas and pins work uh, on various websites, on social media, um, but there, there really wasn't anything to kind of bring it all together and to show this really long historical trajectory from the 19th century um, up to the civil rights movement. So that's what I thought I could do with this book is like really bring together a lot of kind of disparate pieces from, you know, the blogosphere, from uh, from Anthony Penn, Sakibu Hutchinson's work, um, as well as sort of my own training as a scholar of African-American religion. Man, I'm super glad <laughs> that the African-Americans for Humanism website was, uh, was useful to you back then. Um, for those of you out there who don't know, before I started at American Atheists a year and a half ago, I spent 12 years working at the Center for Inquiry doing campus and community programs. And one of the things also that I was in charge in, in addition to working with Center for Inquiry branches and affiliated campus groups, was uh, I became in charge of African Americans for Humanism in 2010 and ran it until I left in 2018, the end of 2018. And our biggest um, campaign was a billboard campaign that we got a nice donation for. We did billboards for Black History Month in 2012 in seven different cities with eight different local spokespeople on the billboards. And we used part of the donation to put together a new website, including information about Black historical freethinkers and humanists. Mm -hmm. But we had a very short time frame to do it, and so <laughs> When you mentioned that, I had a sudden flashback to late nights, you know, my butt aching and sore from working so hard and 
uh, working with the team of people to do the research, you know, we had a longer list than the 10 that we first put up, but yeah, uh, yeah it was, and like messaging out to people like Anthony Pinn and Sakivu Hutchinson so that we could get more information because it wasn't collected easily in one place. You know, if you could go back in time <laughs> and provide with me with this work, you would have saved me a lot of very long nights uh, sitting at my computer trying to put some of this together without having the background to do some of the research that you were able to do for this book. So <laughs> yeah. thank you. For I that. mean, I think it's, it's maybe seeing a picture of that billboard of, of was there one of Langston Hughes? I, I think there is one of Hughes. And I had no clue Hughes was a free thinker, right? So I started, you know, reading everything that I could on Hughes and reading his autobiography. And then I'm like, oh, okay, you know, there's there's quite a lot here, right? Both in his autobiography and in his poetry. And it's just like, just that one little nugget of, hey, this is a black humanist, right? And that, that sort of led me down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> Sweet. <laughs> I don't know if I knew that. Uh... But I'm I'm very glad to hear about that. It's those kinds of campaigns can have a long effect. And I still meet black atheists in different cities who say, you know, the first thing I saw happened to be this ad somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, one uh, I think there was some expectation because at the time it was 2012, there had never been as large of a simultaneous atheist related billboard campaign. And so because atheists were exciting on TV, there was some thought that we would get, we might get attention from people like Bill O'Reilly, right? Mm -hmm. That he'd be like, oh, the atheists are targeting the blacks now. Yeah. Bill O'Reilly doesn't care about black people. <laughs> you can quote me on that. Bill O'Reilly does not care about black people. He also didn't care about this billboard campaign. Uh, there were people in black media, The Root, The Grio, and other sources who were very, very excited to mm -hmm. see this. And of course, the local groups where the billboards were in particular really saw a boost in engagement. People saying, just, I had no idea there were others out here. I thought I was alone, which was the purpose of the campaign. You know, yeah. the, we're eight years later now and circumstances are different. People can connect with black non-believers. You have the, the shirt on. Um, and other things more easily online. But at the time, there were very few local groups and very few people who were out there being publicly non-religious, non-believers in the black community in particular. Yeah. So I've actually, uh, <laughs> again, going back in time and uh, talking about the kinds of things that this book brings and can be as a resource for people. I um, was thinking like, <laughs> that was a short story that's related. So I first got involved in this community when I was 20, which was 20 years ago now. Woohoo, long time. And I was so excited as well to find out that there was just a free thought community, there are humanist groups and atheist groups in Philadelphia and around the country. I joined every single one I could in my region. And when I transferred into Temple University, I decided to try to start a group there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I actually got some pushback from particularly grad students. Temple University has a very large and thriving African-American studies program. I believe yeah. it's the first in the nation and it might be the largest. And the yeah. professor who coined the term Afrocentrism is a professor there. Mm -hmm. So when I started putting around flyers and things for, I think it was gonna be called Free Thought, Temple University Freethinkers. Uh, some of my friends who were grad students in African-American studies were very critical. And they said, one said, a good friend of mine said, don't you know that humanism is a harmful Eurocentric ideology? And mm -hmm. I was like, I did not know that. <laughs> Maybe it is, because all I see when I go to events and <clears throat> when I hear from speakers and when I look at the magazines and the books is... Europeans and people of European descent. Yeah. So maybe there's a lot here that I don't know. Let me stop my efforts to move forward with starting this group and do some research. And I found uh, some books by Norm Allen who ran African Americans for Humanism at the time, but not much else. Mm -hmm. And I sort of opened a rabbit hole into uh, uh, criticisms of certain aspects of the enlightenment and things. But 
in your research and doing the work you're doing, have you gotten any blowback from the academy, either from other academics or even from some of your students for the line of research you're doing or being a black atheist? Have people even accused you of bias, maybe, because you're bringing a certain perspective to your research? Not yet. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it, it might be coming, right? So the book just came out in September. I've given a lot of book talks, um, but there haven't been any reviews of it yet. Um, like I said, acad academics are very liberal. Uh, a lot of them are non-religious. So like my own colleagues, you know, a lot of them uh, aren't particularly religious or are like UUs or something. Um, so they're, they're just very open, even if they are personally religious, they're just open to other viewpoints and whatnot. Um, so I have not gotten a lot of like overt pushback um, against this book. Um, and I've been presenting parts of it for years. What I have seen curiously um, is that in, in kind of academic circles, it does seem to be more well received by white scholars than by black scholars. So when I've given kind of more strictly academic talks, I notice the audiences are larger. It, you know, um, if it's at a university like a PWI or something, when I've given talks at um, ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, there'll be like four people or five people in the audience, right? Uh, and they say, what is it? The opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference, right? Um, so you just, there hasn't been that open pushback. It's just, I've seen some like unwillingness or just non-interest um, from black scholars uh, in, in this work. Um, so, so that that's it. It's just really kind of small audiences at that conference, but you know that that could be for a number of reasons. Maybe not even because they um, are opposed to the work or whatever, but the panel was at nine in the morning or something. You know, you just it, it's hard to tell. Um, but yes, yeah, surprisingly, there has not been a lot of pushback. I I've taught. Um, one course explicitly on free thought, and I incorporate lectures on um, both black and white free thinkers into like my general courses on uh, United States and African American history. Um, and you know, my students don't really complain um, because you know I I sort of present it not necessarily as these are my personal views. But this is sort of like the intellectual history of the revolutionary era or the 19th century, right? These are just ideas and I give evidence for the prevalence and the existence of those ideas. Um, so I can't say I've really gotten much pushback from students either. In fact, um, it, it was kind of nice that uh, I, I taught a course on free thought, I think in what, 2016 or something? And then just last year, I was out having a drink um, at a bar right across from campus and I ran into one of my former students. I didn't even know he was a former student because it was a very large uh, lecture course. It was like 100 people. And he's like, yeah, I took this course with you a while. It was like all these like non-believers and stuff. Your course really messed me up, man. Like, I don't even know what to think anymore. This is a black guy. Um, I'm like, yes, that's that's great. Like that. <laughs> You know, I, I wasn't trying to like evangelize you or anything. I was just trying to teach you about this really, you know, significant aspect of American religious and intellectual history. But for some people, like being exposed to these works and reading these works and about these people for the first time makes you question some things, right? Um, if you're kind of an open and critical thinker, it, it can it can cause some questions and and challenge some assumptions. So that was actually kind of nice. <clears throat> cool. Neat. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. But the blowback might be nice, you know, pe people, you know, burn in the book or whatever, that means they buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll so. call my old friend. I don't know where he is now, but he might be back in Atlanta. <laughs> it's been a while. I'll be like, hey, remember you told me about Humanism, guess who, I know this guy, he wrote a book. Send yeah. it your way. <laughs> See what his connections are right now. 
Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, so when when we were working on the African Americans for Humanism billboard campaign back in the last month of 2011 into beginning of 2012, so it could launch for Black History Month, we, well, I, I wanted to showcase several historical figures that were recognizable for a billboard, right? So like Hubert Henry Harrison wasn't going to do it for a lot of people. They'd be like, that's probably a historical figure. So I needed, you know, the Frederick Douglass, Zora Neale Hurston, and then mm -hmm. we went with Langston Hughes. Um, and as the team of people who, other than me at Center for Inquiry working on this were white, but, you know, I was working with communications and the art department and others, and we really needed to pull a lot of things together quickly for a massive billboard campaign to launch in a short time. But uh, one person who did some research on the figures noted that he was concerned that Langston Hughes was a communist. And did we want to put Langston Hughes on our billboard? Mm -hmm. I was like, they were all communists back then. Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> like, I don't think they were Marxists. Like, I don't think that's a problem. Then, yeah, um, Hughes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was a communist. Um, organized uh, a, or, a group called the League of Struggle for Negro Rights. Um, in the 1920s, he was pretty active uh, in the movement, and of course, his, his uh, one of his most well-known poems, "Goodbye Christ," basically argues that we should we should get rid of belief in Jesus and you know believe in Marx, right? <clears throat> yeah, I think the uh, especially for atheist organizations and secular organizations and people who've been around for a while in them, there's uh sometimes been a concern about associating atheism with communism or marxism you know yeah. after some segment of history and so this seems like it might be uh, a negative factor for consideration of who's going on the billboard uh zora neale hurston was another had another area of concern in that she was against it seemed school desegregation Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, if, you know, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, she was a Republican into the 40s, was fairly conservative for a, a black thinker, I think, later on, um, kind of after the Harlem Renaissance had ended. So, um, yeah, I could see that. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, especially at an overwhelmingly white organization, uh, as all of the groups basically in the secular movement are, um, well, not all of them, but the, the largest of them um, are, I could understand being afraid about putting Zora Neale Hurston's face on billboards and bus ads and bus shelter ads and subway ads in different cities, and then being accused of promoting segregation if there was an association there. Mm -hmm. I didn't think there was, but I really didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> And so fortunately, I had some people I could reach out to to say, hey, what do you think of this? And they were like, nope, not a problem. Sakibu Hutchinson, Anthony Pinn, and others uh, gave me some input. I asked people at, in DC where we were putting her face on the ads, and they were like, nope, she's awesome. Yeah. She has her issues, but so does everyone. So it was fine. So that, that all went forward well. So <laughs> speaking of this, a lot of the people that you talk about in the book but by the way, we did, when we ran an excerpt from, from your book in the American Atheists magazine issue from November, December, we used Zora Neale Hurston for the cover photo. Yeah, yeah. and so. she's on the cover of my book as well. Yeah, fortunately, no one was like, why are you pro-school segregation? <laughs> Anyone who's on this call, don't start doing that now, please. <laughs> don't be like, I learned something. Also... <laughs> I'm going to tweet that, and now people will be very angry. <laughs> so a lot of the people that you talk about in your book are involved in racial justice activism of some kind or other. Mm -hmm. Some number of them got involved with communist and socialist groups. You know, 
some smaller number of them got involved officially with humanist and atheist groups. But no matter what most of them were doing, there was some facet of it that was related to promoting racial equality, racial justice, challenging racism, challenging white supremacy where there are, right? Yeah. So there's this close relationship, it seems, for some of them to have their religious beliefs and religious positions shaped by their politics and experience, right? Mm -hmm. You're a historian, but can you talk about how your research for this book and similar projects helped to shape, like how it might inform your perspective on the current state of religion and religiosity, particularly in the black community? Yeah. Big question. Um, well, we do, we do know that uh, irreligion, those who identify as non-religious, not having any particular religion among African Americans has been sort of growing steadily, um, especially over the past couple of decades with, you know, some of the smaller black free thought organizations, but especially with the flowering of um, black non-believers, right, and its growth in a number of cities um, throughout the country. Um, and so we see, especially from, you know, Anthony Penn's work and Sakibu Hutchinson's work, that for the overwhelming majority of black freethinkers, um, historically and today, they felt that they simply do not have the luxury to only um, sort of think about separation of church and state or to push for um, teaching evolution in schools and, and uh, you know, against creative design and stuff like that. And it's not like those issues aren't important to black secularists. They are, um, but they're part of a much broader agenda of bringing about a more just society. And that can't happen if all we're focused on is separation of church and state, right? Um, that's going to happen primarily if we're looking at um, and trying to fight for racial equality. So um, I, I'm actually, one of the projects I'm working on right now is uh, an edited collection called Race, Religion, and Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm one of two editors, along with my uh, colleague, uh, Phil Sinatere at um, the College of Biblical Studies in Houston, a small kind of theological school. And we've gathered 11 different essays on various aspects of religion uh, and Black Lives Matter. Um, and we can see that, you know, secularism, uh, free thought is a very important component um, of today's sort of organizing and today's politics, right? Um, the, especially in the idea that not just black lives matter, but all black lives matter, right? When we add that all, it can really challenge a lot of the sort of theological presuppositions and practices of African-American Christianity and of American Christianity writ large, right? When we say that um, trans black lives matter. Um, there are a lot of religious groups who do not believe that, right, and who would sort of fight against that, uh, including African-American religious groups. So, um, so that, that is an important component. But like I said when I was talking about James Foreman, um, you know, the, the movement today is uh, incredibly diverse, the Black Lives Matter movement. So it's not only a secular or materialist uh, movement, right? So we see some of the... Um, early leaders of um, Black Lives Matter, um, like Patrice Cullors and um, Opal Tometi, right? Patrice Cullors, I think, is um, a uh, practitioner of the Yoruba uh, religious tradition, Ifa, right? Um, Opal Tometi is um, a, a Christian in this sort of social justice, right? Um, activist line, right? Um, that, that kind of rejects the otherworldly part of Christianity. So I think, you know, secularism is a key part of Black Lives Matter, but it's a very sort of religiously diverse uh, tradition. Another book that I'm working on um, right now is called Liberal Religion and Race in America. And the final chapter, it's basically a long exploration of um, African Americans' uh, participation in and contributions to uh, Unitarian Universalism, 
And the last chapter uh, of the book looks at this sort of recently created group, uh, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, right, which uh, came about at the um, 2015 Black Lives Matter convening uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, right, and there were a number of activists from all over the country, and it just so happened that some of those leading activists also happened to be uh, Unitarians, and they were just around talking politics, talking religion, um, and sort of found kind of creative ways to blend their liberal theology with the political philosophy of Black Lives Matter. Um, and of course, you know, Unitarian Universalists is are a very kind of theologically diverse group, right? If you go to a UU church, you'll find people who are theists and um, people who are atheists, some are pantheists, right? They're, they're sort of a wide kind of theological uh, spectrum there. So all that is to say is that um, BLM is very kind of religiously diverse, um, but secularism and secularists are playing a very important uh, part in Yeah, I agree. I think it's been interesting to see as it kind of coalesced how often on the local level and even looking at the national voices, the people we saw were queer. Uh, we saw a lot of women mm -hmm. and non-men. Um, and overwhelmingly, the leadership has skewed young and participation has skewed young. And a lot of times, you know, it's, and we see that it's the younger people who are leaving the churches. And often, of course, there's a correlation between being members of the LGBTQ community and leaving religion. We saw that in the survey that American atheists did. We mm -hmm. had 30,000 respondents back in the fall and produced the reality check report, and there was a kind of surprisingly high correlation. <laughs> a large, a surprisingly large percentage of respondents were members of the LGBTQ community. It also, I think skewed young, but I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the report. Not overwhelmingly surprising. We know that there have been different issues there, but yeah, totally, that's interesting. You mentioned, therefore, two upcoming projects so far, though, one with the Unitarian Universalism and the one about Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's an edited collection. Um, the, the Liberal Religion and Race will be a solo authored book that I'll probably publish in the next three or four years or so. And then I've already begun collecting sources and you know collecting articles and sort of thinking about a second volume on Black Free Thought. Um, so this first book, uh, Black Freethinkers, ends right around 1975 uh, or so um, with the sort of waning influence of the Black Panther Party moving into the 1970s. Um, I do very briefly in an afterword, I think it's like maybe 15 pages, I very briefly kind of trace um, key developments in the movement after that, right? Um, whether they're literary developments with um, some of the work of like Alice Walker, uh, theological developments with Pin's work, um, but also sort of the growing importance and prominence of Black free thought organizations. Um, and, and that afterward is basically what's going to be kind of the crux and what I'm going to do in the second volume uh, on Black free thought, because I think there's a really important story to tell. Um, of the kind of institutionalization um, of Black free thought after 1975. So prior to 1975, we see a kind of growing importance of Black free thinkers, but we don't necessarily see specifically Black free thought organizations, right? So the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was a Black political organization that happened to have a lot of free thinkers. Right. Uh, whereas African Americans for Humanism was a specifically, you know, secular organization. Um, so that that's one of the kind of key themes I'm going to be tracing uh, in this second volume is sort of the growing uh, prominence of, of Black free thought organizations, um, as well as the sort of increasing prevalence of um, 
black free thought and um, and religious skepticism in black popular culture, right? So I'm gonna look at you know TV, Afrofuturism, um, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Um, maybe get a little bit into music. Um, but I mean, you, you could just see that over the past, you know, decade or so that you start to see these sort of explorations of, of skepticism within black communities in a way that you, you really didn't see um, probably prior to, to 2010, right? Um, stuff like you're probably familiar with uh, the blackish episode on, on, on atheism, which is very problematic. Zoe comes <laughs> around and and, and affirms her Christianity, but nevertheless, for them to spend that entire episode sort of exploring uh, free thought among blacks, and you see the different debates, right? You see the uncle who's this sort of hippie, um, probably communist, right? And he's he happens to be the atheist, and then um, Zoe says that she's questioning, and her dad and Dre is like, "Oh, are you a Wiccan? You're a witch because you're questioning." Um, Christianity, right? Those types of explorations you didn't really see before. So that's another aspect I think that'll be um, an important part of the book is like seeing this this growing uh, part of free thought in Black popular culture. <clears throat> well, let me know if I can be any kind of resource for your work for that. If I can help at all, I'd love to be able to. Absolutely, we will do. And then I can <laughs> use your other research as a as a reference for my own studies in the future. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make sure that we have some time for audience questions. And I could, I have a lot more I could ask and say, and I've really appreciated your answer so far, but let's bring Sam back on to see what some questions the audience has are. Sounds good. Hi, that was really excellent. We got a ton of really positive feedback that I will forward on to you of people saying that that was really interesting and, um, and very helpful. So Great, a couple of quick things. We had a couple people ask about your shirt. So I did drop that link oh, into the chat <laughs> that is at blackknockbelievers.org and I dropped the I dropped the store link into um into the chat. And then also in there is the link to your book and also to your academia.edu uh, page, which has some PDFs of your other articles and your other works. And I will make sure that all of those links also go out in our follow-up email. And other folks have been asking if we recorded, and we did, and we'll make sure that the recording link goes out as well. So if you missed anything, it went by too quickly, then uh, we will, you'll be able to rewatch it because that was a, a whole bunch of information. So with that, we do have a couple of questions. Um, as usual, there's a few that are kind of in a theme, so I'm gonna mash them together. Uh, there's quite a few people who have asked about, you said you've been on a lot of um, book talks and a lot of tours, and they're wondering if you have given those presentations to places outside of academia and in church groups or black civic groups especially, and how your talk and your book has been received by those audiences. Um, my my talk has been received very well in um, in Unitarian Universalist churches. So I've, I've talked in, in quite a bit of those, probably a, at least five or, or something like that. Um, UU Church out in uh, Pasadena. Uh, I talked at like this UU conference up in Baltimore, actually right after my American Humanist Association talk back in um, October. So. Um, why do you use love learning about black free thinkers? <laughs> um, and black you use do too, actually, because uh, the Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism held their first convening back in late October, uh, early November. Um, and I gave this book talk there, although I brought in some other figures that I didn't really talk about, some folks who were uh, black Unitarians, but were also free thinkers. Um, so I talked about some of them, uh, like Egbert Ethel Red Brown and, and some members of his church. Um, so that's been received uh, pretty well. Um, I can't say I've talked at like black churches, although I would love to. Um, I did talk to, uh, I have a friend here, Shalise Overy, who's 
um, one of the reverends at Pul like Pullman Baptist Church here in Raleigh. Um, so I spoke to like their, they have like a theological discussion group uh, and I spoke to them about some kind of themes in the work and, and, and how black free thinkers kind of critique uh, black theology of liberation that emerged in the 1960s. Um, and they liked it too, but I, I think I could certainly get around a bit more and I, I would love to, to give some more talks to like civic organizations and like your mainline black churches, right? Um, your AME churches and, and some of your Baptist churches. I would, I would love to do that. Just haven't really um, gotten the invitations, but maybe I'll try to be more proactive and just reach out to some ministers like, hey, you guys want to hear about black atheists? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to, to your pushback and I'm very well versed in black religion and theology. So even if you don't agree with what I have to say, I think it, it can still be an interesting discussion. <clears throat> okay, but you're going to have to definitely record those and then send them our way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this virtual format is really good for that because, you know, I, a lot of the talks I've given are just, you know, you had to be there, but um, now it's it's pretty easy to just push the button and, and record it, so. Yeah, absolutely. The whole world is changing in that way, right? Yeah. So let's see, our next question that um, I wanted to ask you was in Chris Hayes' book, A Colony in a Nation, he describes the abuses in the 2014 community of Ferguson as analogous to our founding fathers being abused by an intolerant colonial power. Is there a correlation to atheism in the Enlightenment and rebellion and the lack of sustained rebellion in the black community to religiosity and especially forgiveness for those who have harmed you? That's a complicated one. That's like a whole nother hour. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so this, this actually gets to, um, it, it speaks to one of the questions that I often get, namely, why don't we know more about this, right? I, I wrote sort of a separate article that is on that academia page um, that, that looks at um, basically the uh, idea of kind of black authenticity being tied in with Christianity, right? Um, and one of the reasons that we don't know more about this, that, you know, some other scholar of African-American history didn't take this up 20, 30, 50 years ago, is because of the sort of lingering influence of the politics of respectability uh, within academia and within African-American culture, right? This is something that emerged in the late 19th century, the politics of respectability as uh, sort of a political tool uh, whereby black leaders in, you know, as early as the 1790s, like Richard Allen, founder of the AME Church, Absalom Jones in Philadelphia, were saying that in order to achieve racial equality, in order to help forward the abolitionist movement, uh, we need to show that we're good citizens. We need to show that we're moral, we're upright, we're hardworking, we're not criminals. Um, and most of all, we need to show that we're good Christians, right? Um, so this, this notion that African-Americans publicly had to um, display their religiosity and present themselves in a certain way in order to provide that argument against racism, in order to contribute to the abolitionist movement, um, the fight against Jim Crow, it was an incredibly sort of powerful ideology. Um, and in some respects, it did work, right? I actually show in my book, To Plead Our Own Cause, that the politics of respectability was at times a very effective tool in building alliances with white abolitionists. At other times, it was not an effective tool. There are other times where black churches, these respectable black churches, became the sort of targets um, of racial violence, right? Um, but that politics of respectability has been so sort of prominent within black culture and even among African-American historians that there's there has been this sort of unwillingness to portray the race in a negative light, right? And that's part of the reason why you don't see um, sort of uh, this greater exploration of black free thought. And it's also why that just many African-Americans have shied away from uh, from questioning religion, right? From questioning Christianity. 
great answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> Let's see. We have so many really good questions and we're running close to time. So I'm gonna to try to go through as many as I can. We have a couple of questions about um, the Confederate statues coming down around the South and what we're seeing where um, different monuments are coming down, different statues are coming down. And people are wondering if there's a way to organize our um, communities within our own cities, towns, to uh, recognize and honor black free thinkers. And if you had any ideas about who would be good and, and uh, how to go about doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just, just pick some of the characters in the book, right? There, there are so many of them, um, whether we're looking at um, individuals like Frederick Douglass or William Wells Brown in the era of slavery, um, whether we're looking at some of these really prominent writers, a lot of them already are recognized, right? We already have statues to a lot of these people, but one of the things that we can do is just add in um, and, and make sure we note that there are also free thinkers or religious skeptics or atheists or agnostics, right? So we, we recognize a lot of these people um, as kind of towering intellectuals and political activists. Um, you know, somebody like Huey Newton, we recognize him as the founder of the Black Panther Party. I don't know if there's a statue to him in like Oakland or, or something, um, but there should be, right? And it should mention his religious skepticism because that was kind of uh, an important foundation of his political philosophy. So um, yeah, just, just go through the index, <laughs> uh, look at those names, right? See where, uh, where they were from. Um, and, and you might find that a lot of them already have some sort of recognition, but I'm guessing that for most, if not all of them, there won't be that, um, that mention of their religious skepticism. So that's something that just needs to be sort of highlighted and, and played up, I think. <clears throat> Interesting. The next Which question we have. Really, I'm all for the monuments coming down. Um, we don't need <laughs> monuments to, to traitors. Um, to to our our country um you don't see monuments to hitler i don't think anymore in, in germany so <clears throat> yeah no you definitely don't except for uh, in some museums but yeah. that's pretty limited we don't have them in the in the rotunda of the main intersection in town right exactly so let's see you touched briefly on this um but Curious if you could dive more into the connection between modern white evangelical conservatives, the anti-LGBTQ, anti-abortion movement, and pro-segregation evangelical Christians of the Jim Crow era. Um, okay, uh, okay. So, I mean, I think modern evangelical conservatism is really sort of in a long line. Um, that can date back at least theologically to some of those pro-slavery uh, religious thinkers um, back in the antebellum period, right? So people like Thornton Stringfellow who was a um, Baptist minister, um, pro-slavery thinker. Um, and what we see is throughout American history, these sort of consistent uses um, of scripture, these consistent uses of Christianity to enforce what is seen as quote unquote natural, right? Um, and in the 19th century, what was seen as um, and was seemingly natural uh, to many, if not most white Southerners and many probably if not most white Northerners was the subjection of African Americans, right? Um, that theology kind of morphed a bit in the late 19th century where you don't necessarily see pro-slavery theology, but pro-segregationist theology that God decreed uh, that white and black races should be separate, they shouldn't intermarry, have sex with one another, really even um, be involved socially uh, at all, right? Um, so I, I just think that today's sort of anti-LGBTQ uh, conservatives, uh, theological conservatives are 
um, very much in this sort of same kind of theological uh, tradition of you know American fundamentalism um, that that dates back um, to the antebellum period. So there 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 is a pretty clear line. Uh, obviously, things have sort of have morphed a bit. Um, but I think we really can draw a clear line theologically from pro-slavery thinkers to um, conservative evangelical thinkers today. And unfortunately, we are starting to see more and more conservative evangelicals uh, articulate ideas that are kind of similar to pro-slavery thought, right? I wasn't there just a couple of days ago some um, preacher was calling slavery a blessing, right, uh, which is very akin to the types of arguments um, that some of these theologians and um, Christian ministers were using in the antebellum period that basically God brought, you know, these savage and barbaric Africans out of their uh, country and um, Christianity Christianity was sort of a blessing to them, and slavery was a blessing to them because it introduced them uh, to the gospel. Their uh, bodies might be enslaved, but their souls would be uh, free in Christ. Uh, and we're kind of seeing some of those same ideas around um, today. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing uh, sort of a resurgence of um, segregationist thought um, among Christian conservatives. <clears throat> So I'm going to, I think we have time for one more. Um, since you mentioned Afrofuturism and music, could you please talk a little bit about what you see as the differences and similarities between spiritualism and religiosity? Um, and then also somebody else was wondering at the same time if you are going to talk about Monica Miller's work with hip hop and religion to kind of smash those two together. Mm -hmm. uh, so spirituality to me is um, it, a belief and idea that there are kind of larger forces at work in the world, but it's not necessarily tied to um, some of the doctrinal creeds that we see in particular churches. So um, you might have, it might come along with sort of a belief in God or some sort of higher spirit, some sort of higher power, right? Um, but doesn't necessarily entail one kind of going to church or um, believing in certain theological tenets. So we might still see somebody who is spiritual be a theist, um, but not necessarily an advocate of any particular sect um, of a religion, right? So that's kind of what I see to be um, the difference there. Um, and yeah, I certainly do uh, and, and will be engaging with uh, both Monica Miller's and Anthony Pinn's work on, on religion and hip hop because um, I, I think there is a growing sort of trend of um, secular rappers. And I think even if we look back to um, some of the rappers of the 80s and 90s and, and listen to them carefully, uh, we can probably find even um, more uh, of a sort of prominence of free thought than might have previously been um, recognized. So yeah, I certainly look forward to sort of engaging with both of their works uh, in this book and we'll probably have um, a separate chapter on sort of music and contemporary black secularism. <clears throat> Excellent. So with that, unfortunately, we have a bunch of questions still here, but we are at time and a little bit past. So I just want to take a minute and thank you, uh, Debbie and Chris. And I'm going to remind everybody that we have more of these coming um, in the next few weeks. And I just dropped the link in to sign up for the next ones. We have Mendisa Thomas from Black Nonbelievers next week, um, and then Jay Wexler the following week. And then we have uh, Jennifer Driver, who will be talking to us about um, sex education uh, from CECUS the next week. So 
We have a really good lineup still ahead. And once again, this was recorded and we will be sending out a follow-up email with all of these links and more information. And um, I'll make sure that the link to that shirt is in there. And, and once again, thanks very much for um, a really great program. We had a ton of really positive feedback. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Chris. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Have a good night. All right, you too. <laughs> and bye everyone. So.